Well, hey folks, Research here. We're in Duncan Mills, California at the uh, annual Civil War Days out here. There were no Civil War battles fought in Duncan Mills, California, but it's still a nice area. Redwood trees, ocean, cool temperatures. Uh, you didn't see a whole lot of Civil War battles like that, but it's still nice out here. A, a Civil War reenactment, a reenactment of any kind really, involves people doing the living history thing. They dress up in period appropriate clothing, use period appropriate equipment, even period appropriate language, and they allow you to sort of step into history here. Does that sound silly to you, people? spending their time and energy and money to come out to a place like this and pretend to be something they're not, to pretend to be a soldier, to pretend to be a sutler or an artilleryman or a doctor? Does it seem silly that a Californian would do that when California played almost no role in the Civil War anyway? At first glance, it looks like that, doesn't it? It seems like this is just a waste of time, a waste of energy, but it's really not. It, the people who do this tend to be very passionate about this sort of thing. These people are here because this is their opportunity to, to honor and respect the people and the events of the past. You see reenactors of all sorts of different things, but I would say in America the Civil War is probably the single biggest thing people like to reenact. The Civil War, even 150 years later here, still ripples through our collective consciousness with far-reaching effects, and people appreciate how important that event was in this nation's history. So. It's a nice day out here. There's a good turnout. The weather is nice. It's cool. It's sunny. A lot of folks are really feeling into it right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk around. We're going to chat a little bit. Let's see if we can find some of the stuff from the game here. Maybe we can find a Spencer rifle. Maybe we can find a pepper box revolver. Who knows what we'll find at something like this. So let's take a walk around and this will be our supplementary video for this week. Join me, won't you? We're here in the uh, in the Signal Corps station over here. Signal Corps, of course, is in charge of all our uh, communications and such. And it looks like we're all dialed in for a telegraph. So can you tell me a little bit about what is the communication situation here? I know the classic idea is the, the Pony Express rider with the message and he's running to go save the day, but that's not how they were communicating back to their back to their home bases, back to Richmond. What, what, what kind of rig are we looking at here? Well, it's very rare to have a telegraph out in the battlefield, but we're thinking about this at all the train stations when the tra you know the railroads were being built, they'd always build a, you know the train station, the telegraph office. So we're here at Duncan's Mills and right over here at Duncan Mills is the train station. So we can tap in with our telegraph uh, for you know our communications. We're very fortunate to have a telegraph here, the old clicking code. Now telegraph is uh, what it is is a electromagnet right here. And think of a regular magnet that you would put, you know, on your uh, on your refrigerator at home. Well, this is uh, a a coil, and once you uh, you wrap a wire around a, a nail or something, and you put a battery to it, it becomes magnetized, electromagnet. So, so when I push the key down, uh, the battery energizes the coil. I get the click. So the fella, and there was a gentleman who made this back in 1860s, or excuse me, 1840s, and his name was Samuel Morse. Hmm, that sounds kind of familiar. Is there a, there a code uh, named after this fella? Of course, he made the, the code Morse code. 
And, and what Morse code is, is every character in the alphabet, uh, A through uh, Z and the numbers, he put a dit and dash to it. So let's kind of just look over here and see by, by simply hitting the fast three dits, I get my S. And O, dash, dash, dash. And S, dit, dit, dit. So let's do an SOS now. Can everybody hear that little difference? Now the dits are slow, so uh, I, I'll, or excuse me, uh, the dits are faster and the dashes are a little bit longer, you stress them. So here's, here's SOS. You see? So think of Morse code as like a front, a French or German or Ita Italian uh, Morse code. It's a language and you learn to speak uh, Morse code. So go ahead. Yes. Well, that, that sounds like an awful faster way to communicate, but it seems to me if I were a handsome Confederate uh, cavalry commander and there were a dang Union Army marching around in my territory, I would want to be snipping as many of these telegraph lines as I could. So if that's the case, if your telegraph suddenly goes dead, what do you do next? How do you communicate with the other folks? Very good question. You know, the, during the Civil War, our job as Signal Corps is the officers uh, needed supplies. They need... Uh, Munition. They need a, another 8,000 troops. Uh, they need food, toilet paper, and they would come to the Signals uh, Corps and say, "Hey, get me uh, those items." Now, if those Yankees were cutting our lines, of course, you know we go over and cut their lines too, and we climb their poles and read their messages. Well, those Yankees are pretty sharp. Cause they come over and and climb our poles and read our messages. You're telling me that they weren't encoding these messages? They weren't using some sort of secret code? Morse code was enough? Well, they would encrypt. Uh, they would encrypt their messages. Uh, encryption is as, sim as simply as, let's say today's book, uh, my secret book today, uh, I would encrypt a, if I sent the character B in the book, it says today it's C. So I've officially, effectively changed the character to another something and that's called encryption and so we outdid those yankees by being the first encryptors and they caught on quick so they caught it you know abraham lincoln may i tell you a story about it Abra now there's a there was a movie out called uh, lincoln by a fellow by the name of Sa uh, daniel day lewis who is a you know a, an actor who played lincoln in that movie it shows uh president lincoln leaving the white house going across the street to the War Department every day to go sit in the telegraph office. Because the telegraph office, Lincoln was one of the very first presidents to have mass communications, his telegraph. And he would get all these messages from his favorite generals. And of course, one of his famous generals, Ulysses Grant, I'm sure everybody heard of Ulysses Grant. And Ulysses Grant would say, President, I need 10,000 troops. I need munitions. I need, uh, uh, you know, any toilet paper, whatever, you, what, whatever it is. And because Washington had instant telegraph messages, Lincoln could get those supplies and things to his men. So uh, telegraph was very effective in in 1860 uh, Civil War. Really, probably about the first time in history we saw telegraph communication being uh, playing a, playing a major role in that sort of thing there i suppose between the telegraphs and the railroads since i understand those tended to be in the same place that's right you know you, uh, earlier you asked me if the telegraph lines were down what what i would do well, right over there i have a great cav group cavalry and i would write out a dispatch a letter uh, and that dispatcher, that rider, is going to take it all the way down to uh, Virginia or Alexandria, somewhere, and find those supplies. So if I can't get uh, my telegraph to work, my supplies, uh, or get my supplies, I will have a horseman go, you know, uh, move, move that on. So that's, that would be my job. And think of the telegraph office as like the uh, post office. You know, we, we, uh, 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 if you had a, a message or a letter, that you wanted to send out, you would come here, fill out a message form, and we would uh, do our darndest, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to get that out. And that's that's uh, that's the Signal Corps Telegraph Office's job.
Well, this one here is an Army 1860, and uh, this was probably the most common handgun uh, that was used during the Civil War. Uh, this one here, there was a lot of them made. Uh, my particular weapon here is a... Uh, Colt, the, the Colt Army and the Colt Navy. Those were different calibers, I believe. Uh, this is a 44, and it, it came in both. And uh, this one here is a modern firearm. This is made by Pieta, or this is a Uberti. Uh, Uberti and Pietas are usually the, the number one manufacturers of, of all these uh, remakes here. And also there's Colt. Colt makes a lot of them too. Now that's that's interesting. That's uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's an Italian company that's doing a lot of these reproduction firearms. Yes. It, any idea how that ended up being the case instead of Colt or Remington or these guys continuing to do their own firearms? You no, know, Colt makes theirs, and uh, theirs are very very high quality. Uh, you know, they're made to specs just like these are, but they're a little bit more expensive. So, you know, for us reenactors, you know, if you're going to go and buy a gun, you know, you want to buy something that's that's going to be nice and functional. This is a functional gun. This is this is a remake, but it's not just for reenacting. This will actually fire real rounds. So I see that you've got the uh, the lever on the underside there. So that means that you're you're packing each one of these cylinders individually. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you can load it with the gun. Uh, this particular model, you pop this out. That's the guy where the cylinder comes completely off. And the barrel comes off like that. Oh boy. And then go like that, and then you can change cylinders in the field. So would that be that? Would that be the idea then? Instead of sitting there trying to thumb rounds into the cylinder, there you would just pull out another packed one, ready to go, and keep firing. Yes, and uh, we keep these on our belt. It goes in a specially designed holster for that contains just the cylinder. So you could have reloaded cylinders, one gun, and be able to shoot it, you know, through three times, two times. Now, this is a Colt. Now, I understand that Colt uh, went and made a repeating rifle after a while that was prone to all the cylinders going off at once and being a rifle and having the uh, the shooters left hand out in front that would sometimes result in the injury of the shooter did the pistols ever have issues like that or were they a little bit more reliable you know the uh it was a cavalry model that i know of that had the cylinders it was uh just like this and it has a longer barrel instead of having the short barrel and it will all these will flash off. What you're calling is a flash off. Okay. Okay. And it flashes off because... I've got to get this thing back together. That's why I don't load mine in the field. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll flash off because in the front of the cylinder here, uh, when the powder goes off, it can get inside of the actual where the bullet goes inside the cylinder okay. and that's what causes it to flash off all of them. Now I'm sure that could injure the firer but uh, would that destroy the, the pistol as well? No, no, probably not. Probably not. Well that's pretty good. With this one here we use uh, cream of wheat over the top and that keeps it from flashing over. That's what that white stuff is in there. Okay, yeah, I can see that there's some white material. So that's on top of the of the powder. That's not the powder itself. You can use that or a uh, or foam. Use a foam to uh, protect the cylinder. This has a shorter barrel, as you can see, than the uh, than the army. Yeah, I see. There's a pretty big size difference there. Yeah. I chose this because these were going to be my pommel guns. Uh, in the cavalry, you can carry four pistols. You say you're allowed to, or or, or more that that's what's practical. But that in the Civil War, you know, that was very common that they would carry four pistols. I, I understand Jeb Stewart was pretty known for having all sorts of pistols and knives and things dangling off of his saddle. Yes, exactly. We have this here uh, with a shorter barrel. This is an Army 58, and uh, is that the Remington 58, the 1858? And uh, as you can see, right there. Oh, I see that, that cream of wheat in there again. And I'll point it right here at the thing, and you can see right going right through like that. 
Now, uh, does that cylinder pop off in the same way as the Colt there, or are you stuck uh, doing these individually? These here will come off. Um, the Uberti, which is what these are. These are the Italian Ubertis. Oh, this is the same. Yeah, it's from Uberti. Okay. They make it. It's the Italian one. See the... Oh, there it is. That cylinder just comes right out of there. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Look at that. Boy, that has got some weight to it right there. I can really see why these were such prized pieces for a while. I understand that the Remingtons were much more expensive than the, uh, than the Colt armies, uh, but the people that were able to get a hold of them uh, considered them just fantastic pieces. Can you feel the difference between that barrel and this barrel? Oh boy, that's even heavier there. So that's, I see that length there, is that, uh, I feel like I can, I can picture some battlefield paintings of a guy holding this by the barrel and bashing people. Now I know the other, the other pistol that I know, uh, you know, is so iconic out of the war is the, uh, the Lamatt revolver, uh, which I understand had, had something like a shotgun shell or a, a second barrel or something uh, in, in there. Uh, I don't believe I've seen anybody with those out here, but, uh, but I would think that something like a shotgun shell and a pistol configuration here would probably be a little hard on the wrist too. I think that in, uh, in the cavalry, I think that they did. Uh, have that 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 was a common one amongst the cavalry. You know, it was it was a small shotgun. You know, it wasn't very big. I'm not very sure, but I think it was an 89 caliber, something like that. One last question there. I would be very surprised if I see one out here today. But the uh, the pepper box revolver, that uh, that guy with the, just all the barrels instead of an individual cylinder there. I know that those were still hanging on towards the very beginning of the war. Were those at all useful in a field type operation here, or uh, or is it just just silly to even think of seeing one of those in uh, in a battle? No, uh, you know everybody was really close quarters. You know they they packed them shoulder to shoulder. It would be a great gun to have. You know, <laughs> you know they were making canister bombs for the cannons and the artillery. You know, there's no no reason why you wouldn't do that. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, who you are, what, uh, who, who you're working with? Certainly. Thanks for coming, too. I'm Clayton, Captain Clayton Matthews, and I'm commander of Company A of the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry. If you look at our flag, we have a California grizzly bear on the flag. The California connection is that we're recruited in San Francisco, 500 men total, recruited in San Francisco to become part of the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry Regiment. That wouldn't be where the famous California Joe came from, would it? No, he was part of the sharpshooters. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, you don't really hear about California playing uh, quite as much of a role in the war as, uh, as some of the other states. So, California provided a huge amount of uh, money to support the war effort, uh, very supportive of the Sanitary Commission for Soldiers Relief. Well, I'm su I suppose that that's just as important as anything else, considering uh, how many uh, deaths and losses there were to disease and, and various other things like that. Exactly. We needed the men. <laughs> If you're recruited in California, you tended to stay in the western states. But this is the only contingent that actually went east with a California identity to fight in the war. Now, I understand that there was some fear that maybe a Confederate raider might come steaming around the point and shell San Francisco or attack the gold mines or something like that. But uh, that never really ended up playing out, did it? Never happened, but uh, there was some attacks on the whaling fleets in the Arctic. And that's right. Would that be uh, be one of the famous uh, Confederate raiders, the Alabama or something? Shenandoah. Shenandoah. Boy, they just classic the word, names. They got the, the word a little bit late that the war was already over. Was the Shenandoah the one that kept attacking people uh, long after the war? Right. That's right. Mm. Uh, slow communication back then. Well, the reason I came by here is you've just got a fantastic uh, lineup of, uh, of period weaponry over here. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've got? I will. 
Now the California men were issued originally uh, Burnside carbines, which I don't have any examples to show you here. Uh, they turned in the, the Burnsides fairly early and received Sharps single shot carbines, which were very a very popular unit and, and produced in huge quantities. Uh, they, they were famous already before the war. Henry Beecher Stowe was sending uh, Sharps rifles out to Kansas in uh, containers marked Bibles. And so they were referred to as Beecher's Bibles. They, the, that was uh, the bleeding Kansas era. Right, so that's that's a lot of the, uh, the 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 civil strife that led up to what eventually broke out uh, as the war. That's fascinating stuff there. Now you say Burnside repeaters. Is that the same Burnside as uh, as General Burnside? Burnside? They were not repeaters, however. They were still single shot. And and I do have an example of one of the rounds. That they were All right, let's take a look. Pretty strange shape there. It is, but it is a, a very f solid cartridge. It is not primed, it's not self-primed. There's a hole in the very back, the very tail of the cone. And it, this will receive the flame from the primer, which would be on a cone on top of the breech. So the man would break this open like a shotgun, drop the ground in, fit a cap, a, 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 a primer cap, then he could fire. And when, the, when it's time to remove the, pe the, uh, the spent shell, it might not uh, come out very easily. So he might he'd probably keep some extras of this, and he'll force these together and then pull, the, the, pull the, uh, the, the empty shells out that way. Seems a little clunky, but I'm sure better than a single-shot Springfield there. Were the Burnside uh, single shots considered effective weapons? They were. They, they had a mixed review. Uh, the, the, the jury would never really came out with a, a good verdict on those. Some men loved them, some, some hated them. And, and a lot of times it sounded like there was uh, money involved in who decided what, as, as is typically the case in the military. Ain't that always the way. Well, that's fascinating stuff. So what are we looking at right here? This is a Sharps carbine, as I said. This is a horse rifle. It has a ring on the side. It will receive this snap hook that hangs on my shoulder so that this will stay with me all the time whether I'm walking or on horseback. This is the same weapon that fired the first shot at the Battle of Gettysburg. The 8th Illinois Cavalry were mounted, were, were equipped with uh, 1859 style Sharps carbines and th there was a, a, about a 30 man picket duty that was uh, assigned to a position on the Chambersburg Pike. They saw the Confederates at 7 o'clock in the morning on July 1st and began opening fire with their, their Sharps carbines at 600 yards entertaining the Confederates for the next half hour, as they, <laughs> as they said. And uh, that was allowed the other men in the, uh, the other picket units to gather at that location and hold off the Confederates for two solid hours until the Union infantry could take over. Well, they were being forced back step by step. So this is a very slow advance uh, by the Confederates, slowed by the Union cavalry. Certainly. Now, a carbine, of course, is going to be a shortened version of, uh, of a typical infantry rifle, uh, so maybe the Sharps carbines were not the best choice for the long-range shooting, but I understand that the Sharps made a very effective long-range rifle as well, that there were a number of uh, sharpshooters who used these. Absolutely, yes. Uh, they, they were very well-picked men and very uh, accurate shooters with their, with their Sharps rifles. Uh, the Sharp rifle would have two bands, not one band or three bands. So it would be in, in between a musket and a carbine. That, that would be the, the, uh, the definition. And what, what is the style of the block in here? I see it's not a, it's not a breakaway, but, um, uh, but what, you're, you're feeding into the, into the breech there? It's a, simple, it's a simple dropping block, falling block, as they say. The round is wrapped with uh, it, it just gunpowder, wrapped with paper or uh, nitrated linen with a, a 52 caliber bullet. The bullet is inserted into the chamber close the breech, come on, close, there, fit a primer cap onto the cone, bring the hammer to full cock, the piece is now ready to fire. So this is not a cartridge rifle, you're still packing a paper wrapped round in there. Exactly, it is not a metallic cartridge. It's not a metallic cartridge it's, rifle, yes. but did these later fire metallic cartridges? I feel like I, I've seen the sharps in, in the depictions of the in the West in the 1880s, 1890s. They, they were converted to a metallic cartridge uh, style. Uh, they were very good pieces. They were not used by the Army, only in small numbers, and they were superseded by the Springfield. And it didn't take very long. Uh, after the war, the, the Army was mostly using Spencers, Spencer repeaters. And these were all turned in by 1866 or so, except for very small numbers, and replaced with single-shot Springfields again. 
Uh, so a small number of the sharps were converted for the army or kept by the army, but those those were all turned in. Do I see? Oh, <laughs> I I don't doubt it. Do I see over here a Spencer in your rack? Sample example of a Spencer. It loads seven shots through the rear in the in the stock with a magazine, a tube magazine. Drop in seven rounds. Close the follower. Cycle the piece with the lever. You're now ready to fire. You still have to bring the hammer to half cock and then full cock. There is a lot of similarity between the Spencer and the Sharps carbines, and this is done deliberately. Uh, to, to, to keep the men familiar with their piece, even though it was a vastly different rifle. Uh, we wanted to keep a lot of it similar. The cost difference was quite a bit. The $15 for a Sharps carbine versus $40 for a Spencer. We were able to, to bring down the price on the Spencers to about $25, and this is what finally got the, the Army to buy these things. Well, I understand that people who look at the equipment as playing major roles in the uh, in the outcome of the war tend to really point at the Spencer as being uh, as having a disproportionately large impact, both for the the ease of use, the size of the bullet that it was firing, and I know a lot of people compare it to the Henry repeater uh, as being one of the two main repeaters. But my understanding is people largely consider the Spencer the superior of the two. Uh, wh why do you suppose that is? The, the Spencer has a hitting power, penetrating power of over six inches of white pine at 200 yards. The Henry will not do that. The Henry is a 16-shot repeater, but the bullets are essentially pistol size. The, the rounds are, uh, the, the cartridges are, carry as much powder as a typical revolver would fire. So they're essentially a long-arm revolver, whereas this is a true rifle. You're speaking of long-arm revolvers, you make me think of that, uh, that rather tricky Colt uh, rifle that uh, that had that nasty habit of taking the firer's left hand off when all the uh, rounds cooked off. Exactly. Th th those were a good idea, but uh, the machining simply wasn't up to the task. They, they, they would not align correctly uh, in the large size. Now, idea. now is, is the Spencer here the, uh, the, the, the classic uh, you load on Sunday and you fire all week rifle, or was that referring to something else? Uh, I believe it was the Spencer. You could, you, could, you could say that about the Henry as well. Uh, the advantage with the Spencer, me solid metallic cartridges, they're waterproof. You could, you could throw this thing in the water and come out firing. It was a completely self-contained cartridge. It was, it was like an oversized 22, but it's, it's a 52 caliber. Well, it seems like that would be a, a no-brainer to switch over to something like that, but I understand the Confederates didn't have uh, much luck equipping their armies with these. Uh, what do you suppose that was all about? They had to capture them. But all you have to do is read a description of the machine work involved in creating the, the cartridges, the individual cartridges, and you'll see how the Confederates could never catch up with this. There's a lot of machine work involved in creating one of these pieces, and they were able to capture about a thousand or so, but the only ammunition they could use was what they could capture, and they could not make it. So that, that doesn't uh, make much sense at all for them to try to get their hands on Spencer's, Henry's, if they just can't keep the things in ammo, huh? It's such a disadvantage. It is just unbelievable. The Southerners did not have the machinery, the factory capability to make a horseshoe. They had the iron, they could make iron, they had the, the, the iron works, but they did not have the machinery to make all these implements and so forth. Most of the horseshoes had to be captured. But you had a little bit of a disadvantage there, I suppose. Kill them off dead Yankee horses. <laughs> but that'll tell you just how far behind industrially the South is. When, the, when the North, a northern commander can go into a campaign with 10 miles worth of railroad track materials and the South has not produced one piece of track in the entire war, that'll tell you how far ahead we are. Now, that, uh, that also makes me think a little bit about the... Um, uh, oh, gosh, let's see, I lost my, lost my train of thought. Well, but, oh, well, considering the Spencer is such a superior firearm there, I know it would cost more money, but I understand there was a lot of pushback in the, uh, in the Union Army about equipping their men with these Spencer repeaters. Why would there be resistance to going after a, uh, a firearm that's so effective? False economy. General Ripley did not want to sign the checks for these expensive weapons. If he could buy $13 muskets, he would buy $13 muskets instead of a $40 carbine. That's as, it was as simple as that. 
finally Abraham Lincoln was able to get rid of Ripley and he specifically said, I want these, these, these rifles. It was costing Abe Lincoln $3 million a day to support this war. The cost of the horses was just phenomenal. It's $93 million for horses. It's, just, it's building up just uh, astronomically. And now, he wanted the war ended. He knew that a, a, an expensive piece like this would stop the war a lot sooner than going cheap. Now, something that occurs to me there, of course, the firearm is more expensive, but wouldn't the, uh, the ammunition also be more expensive? Would, would switching from a single-shot rifle over to a seven-shot rifle, would, wouldn't that put an awful heavy load on the ordnance department? On the, on the man, on the transportation, on the ordnance department, on the expenses, yes. And this is something that's going to carry with you throughout history. The Army doesn't want you using up too much ammunition. They want you to take slow, deliberate fire. Brave soldier stands in line, takes slow, takes aim, and, and fires deliberately. He does not fire promiscuously with a seven-shot repeater that can blow away all your ammunition in just a few seconds. <laughs> well, he has to carry a box with a hundred rounds in it that, can, that weighs quite a bit on his chest. Uh, so it becomes difficult for the men. If you if you consider how much ammunition weighs, a, a million rounds of ammunition for musketry would be 30 tons. You need 30 wagons to carry that. <laughs> you really start to see the importance of the supply lines in that case, and I suppose makes uh, even more impressive stuff like uh, Sherman's March to the Sea, where they're operating more or less without supply at all. Don't use up too much ammunition. Keep it short. Uh, a soldier might, with a Sharps carbine might carry 20 shots in, in his pouch. I have a pouch on my back like this. Oh, there's the pouch. There's the pouch. There will be a wooden block in there to, to keep the, the rounds uh, separated and keep them protected because they're only paper. Uh, a lot of the men will take out the wooden blocks. We can drop in a few more rounds. With the Spencers, it's not, it's not that important. We can drop in, uh, have, have a box with six tubes filled with rounds. Now, did the Spencer start out with the tubular magazine, or, or was that a, an adaptation that came along later on? I understand the Spencer had a number of improvements over the course of the war. An adaptation. Yeah, I, I don't have the full history on the Spencers. Sure, sure. All right. Well, sir, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me over here. This is just fascinating work there. I really appreciate it. In, in a shoot-off between a Henry and a Spencer, which would you rather have? Well, I mean, a Henry's got more bullets, and it's certainly got that classic Old West to look, but uh, it sounds like a Spencer's firing an awful bigger bullet with bigger uh, or better stopping power. Think of it this way. If you're carrying a Henry or a Spencer, you're on the Union side. It doesn't matter. You can take your pick. The Confederates will not be firing back at you with anything similar. <laughs> I guess that's it. If you get your pick of a repeating rifle, you're already on the winning side. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, folks, that's the ball game. I think that's going to do it for Civil War Days at Duncan Mills. Thanks for coming along with us today. This was a lot of fun. If you get an opportunity to come out to one of these reenactments someday, I really hope you do. The folks who do this sort of thing are so happy to share their knowledge and their experience with you. And for the most part, these tend to go on to benefit really excellent causes. So the next time you get out to Duncan Mills, California, maybe see about coming out to Civil War Days. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video.